the response to a move of God. That's what we're going to be talking about. We're continuing in our journey through the book of Acts this morning. And uh, we've talked about a lot over the last few weeks. We've seen God move in a mighty way, and we're going to see Him move again uh, this morning in a mighty way. But we've, we've, we've seen the Lord share with His disciples. We've seen Him ascend to heaven, and we've seen Him tell us that we will receive the power of the Holy Spirit to be witnesses. And remember, a few weeks ago, we shared about what a witness is. A witness is someone who testifies to what they know. And, and we talked about the only two things that, will, that is causing or, or hindering us from sharing is one or two things, either a fear of sharing and, and no urgency to share, or we haven't experienced anything. Therefore, we can't testify about something that we do not have ourselves. And so I pray that you are witnessing to the testimony of Jesus Christ in your life. And so if you've got your copy of God's Word this morning, uh, turn with me to Acts 2. Stand if you're physically able as we honor the infallible, inerrant, inspired, and sufficient Word of God. Beginning in verse 5, and there were dwelling there in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, speaking of the sound of a mighty rushing wind we talked about last week. When this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? We're going to talk about that. And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phygera and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya and joining Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Hallelujah. For the wonderful works of God. And so they were all amazed and perplexed saying to one another. Whatever could this mean? But look others mocking said they are full of new wine. Would you pray with me? Father in Jesus name Lord speak to our hearts. Lord encourage us this morning. That when you do something supernatural. We don't need to figure it out. We're not smart enough to figure it out. Our intellect won't let us figure it out. Sometimes we just need to look and say, thank God that you did move. Lord, move in a mighty way in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Here in chapter 2, the book of Acts that we've talked about is a turning point. The history of the kingdom of God in Acts 2 records the birth of the church. God is about to do something special. He's getting ready to do something unbelievable. And we saw it last week when they all came together and they heard a mighty rushing wind. And then now we are going to see it is that they are speaking in languages. Some 15 nations of different languages being spoken. And so I want to share with us this morning, if we have time to get through it, three things in, this, in, the, in the scripture if we don't. We'll just catch back up next week. But the first thing we see is this event. This event happening. We've talked about it over the last several weeks. But Pentecost means 50. It's 50 days after the Passover. The Feast of Pentecost was celebrated. And it says people came from every nation under heaven, the Bible says. See, God's assembled here a great multilingual Jewish congregation from all nations where Jews had been scattered and dispersed. And look, they are referred to as devout men. Now, that's interesting when you study that word devout. It means to give honor to, to literally not want to offend God. I just wonder if many of us could be, could be characterized as devout, a, a sense of not wanting to offend God. Can I tell you what offends God? Pride offends God. When you start elevating yourself to where you feel like you something else, can I tell you? You ain't all that in a bag of potato chips, I promise you. You ain't all that. I'm not all that. When we start elevating ourselves, God snubs his nose. He says, I don't want to smell that. How would it be that we would be called devout? And devout just doesn't mean, you know, looking like we want. Listen, we can come and fake it for 90 minutes every Sunday morning. It's more about what are you doing 
Saturday through the rest of the week. And two, by the way, I see folks in the church. Listen, y'all ever notice this? I see sometimes folks act up more in the church on Sunday than they act up on, on Monday through Saturday. They get in helping in that like they don't know how to act. Y'all all right? I can tell you this. God doesn't like that. He won't bless that. And these folks were devout. They didn't want to offend God. They, they, listen, they had found their way back to Jerusalem. They did it a couple of times a year in the annual feast. By the way, it's because of the New Testament fulfillment of the Passover, the fulfillment of the Passover, that we are even assembled here today. This great occasion, this event that brings us together here this morning is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only reason that we have come together to worship the Lord this morning. It's not for good music. It's not for even good preaching. It is to celebrate the, Beth, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason we're here. That's the reason we've come together. That he conquered death. He died on a cross. He conquered hell. He conquered death. He conquered sin. And he's alive today. And all over the world, people are gathered here. Listen, all over the world this morning, people are gathered for the intense purpose to celebrate Jesus Christ. That ought to, right there ought to be enough for you to get excited about this morning. And so we see this event. But not only do we see this event, we see the experience how many times do we go to an event and we leave and we go, I didn't really get anything out of that event. That, that is a personal problem. Look with me here with the experience in verses 6 through 11. Look what happened. And when they, this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were, look, they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. I can imagine this, folks. they just sitting there and they're thinking, okay, these guys are going to open their mouth and I ain't going to understand a word they're saying. And all of a sudden, they're speaking all these different languages and every single person there understood in their own language what was being said. And they was looking around like, man, what in the world's going on? And Aren't those Galileans speaking? Listen, verse 6 says that when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. I want you to understand the multitude was about, listen, was not, listen, they didn't come because they heard tongues. They, heard, they come because a mighty rushing wind sound from heaven. The Holy Spirit is from heaven, and it's noticeable, and it drew them there. I love this passage because it shows us that something ought to be experienced when we meet for the event. This occasion was Pentecost. The experience was all that was occurred at the event. Look what occurred. We see them speaking in over 15 different nations, different languages. And they are speaking of the wondrous works of God. You know what America needs today? We need, listen, the American church needs to experience something when we come together in the event on Sunday morning. We need the experience that can change us while we come together. Too many places that folks will come for the event, but the experience isn't happening. And before you get thinking, well, Terry, are you all about like getting frenzied? And fr no, I ain't talking. I'm talking about God speaking to you and you experiencing a touch on your life as you've gathered with the saints to worship him. I'm telling you, listen, if nothing happens in your heart and life when God's people come together to worship, then you've come unexpected. You're not even expecting to meet the Lord this morning. Because when you'll come with an open mind and an open heart and a surrendered humility, you'll hear from God. See, at Pentecost, God used sound. He used sight. And God used speech to get the people's attention. By the way, I still believe he'll do anything necessary to get your attention. And I've seen him do it in my own life. You start getting, your feet start getting too high off the ground, he'll humble you in a second. 
He'll say, oh, oh, you, you're getting too big for your britches. I'll cut you down a size or two. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You ever been there? He'll do anything necessary, anything and everything to get our attention, to draw us into a relationship with him. See, the heavens declare the glory of God. It says they were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. Did y'all know there was a time? Did y'all know there was a time when everyone spoke the same language? Did you know that? Read your Bibles. In Genesis 11, 1 through 9, listen to this. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed through the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, come, let look. The, the, listen, the worst three words, come let us. The worst three words in the Bible. Come let us. It says, come let us. Make bricks. And bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And he goes on to say, they said, come let us build ourselves. Listen, come let us build ourselves a city. And a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make, listen, let us make a name for ourselves. Come let us make a name for ourselves. Can I tell you, there's only one name that we need to make much of, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. We know what God did. God said, look at them crazy people down there. He said, I can't, I'll come down here. He came down to see the city, the tower. I'm sure he was amazed at it all. I promise you, he wasn't amazed a bit. There ain't nothing man can make. Listen, there ain't nothing man can make that will amaze God. Because he made it all by just speaking. That's why I'm praying for protection for living water. So I pray the protection that God would keep us. From those three words, come let us. So I'm praying that, look, we just got, we just voted last week to take ownership of this property uh, from Colfax Baptist Church. And thank God for how he's moving. But can I tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned in my spirit. Listen, I know that there's things that will need to be done to this building. But can I tell you, the first thing that needs to be done is we need to be a surrendered people inside this building. So when we are surrendered and humble, listen, and humble, then we'll be able to step outside this building and folks will say, look at them folks. They love the Lord. They're making much of Jesus. And I need to be a part of that. And I can tell you, this building, no matter what we do to it, we can't make it attractive enough for folks to come in. They'll only come in because they sense something different about us. Y'all right? I'm, listen, I've been fired up this week. Because I'm telling you now, I, listen, I promise you with all my heart, with all my heart, you're looking at a flawed man. I am not perfect. But I will do anything, listen, and everything to protect this church from anything that harms the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything. And I'll have a word with anybody. Y'all all right? Mm -hmm. See, because it's important. Because the Lord Jesus wants to, I really believe God wants to do something special. I really believe that. But I'm going to tell you now, the devil will work overtime. So be careful that you don't find yourself being worked on by him. It's amazing what God will do with the church that seeks to make much of Jesus Christ. Amazing. Anybody in here beside me want to see him do something amazing? 
Warren Wiersbe says it is. Pentecost, listen, was a reversal of the judgment at the Tower of Babel. So we know God come down and confuse the language, and they didn't even, they couldn't even, the folks that were saying, come let us, they couldn't even understand each other after God got involved. He just scrambled them up. God, the, the, the Pentecost was a reversal. See, God's judgment at Babel scattered the people, but God's blessing at Pentecost united the believers in spirit. And at Babel, the people were unable to understand each other, but at Pentecost, men heard God's praises and understood what was being said. The tower, this is what Warren Wears me, great commentary. The Tower of Babel was a scheme designed to praise men and make a name for men. But Pentecost brought praise to only God. The building of Babel was an act of rebellion, but Pentecost was a ministry of humble submission to God. What a contrast. And so uh, Pentecost was a reversal. And then we see in verse 7, look, we see another look. And there were amazed and marvel, saying to one another, Look at, aren't, aren't, listen, are not all these who speak Galileans? Listen, that resonates with me because I'm from a small hick town. <laughs> See, Gal- Galilee was a hick, hickville. I like to think of it. They were all amazed. So it's almost like a little slur. I mean, looking at these mighty things God's doing, a mighty rushing wind, these men just spoken language of over 15 nations, and we heard our own, look, and they heard their own language in the process, and they're saying, did y'all notice it was Galilean speaking? I mean, why did it make a difference who God was using? Why did it make a difference who God wanted to work through? I mean, look, he used a donkey to speak. Used a roaster to speak. Remember, the roaster reminded Peter of Christ's words. So if he'll use a donkey and a roaster, can I tell you, Lord, encourage you today, he can use you. <laughs> Don't put qualifications on what you think ought to be in place for God to move. Galileans were considered uneducated, unsophisticated by the Judean Jews. Now, you have to understand, again, it's, they're from Hickville, from the boondocks. Y'all all right? Boondocks, that's where I'm from, the boondocks. Had to pipe electricity and water in there. <laughs> the boondocks. And look, the only people that lived out there in the boondocks in Galilee... We're uneducated, uninformed farmers and people who just weren't really the cult, they weren't in the cultural flow. Y'all remember Philip when he found Christ, went to tell Nathaniel he had found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Remember Nathaniel's response? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth, a city of Galilee, nothing can be done by someone who's from there. I mean, I know how, look, I know how these folks must have felt coming from a little obscure town of, of no, no notoriety, no value. Can I tell you, it doesn't matter where you're from and it don't matter what your last name is. If you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, he can and will use you if you'll let him. He chooses to use who he wants to and many times he chooses to use the nobody. Sometimes I'm still amazed at what he did in my life, what he continues to do in my life from a little country boy from Cander, North Carolina. And I'm thankful. Reminds me of this passage of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26 and 29. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. That ain't me talking. That's the Lord. Not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty will be called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world 
to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing to things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. I like the way John MacArthur comments in his commentary on his verse. Listen, God disdained, listen, God disdained human wisdom. Not only by disallowing it as a means of knowing him, uh, but he does not call to salvation the many whom the world would call wise, mighty, and noble. God's wisdom is revealed through the foolishness of the cross of Christ. No, listen, no saved sinner can boast that he has achieved salvation by his intellect. See, God disdained human wisdom. Not Look, not only disallowed as a means of knowing him, it doesn't matter how smart you are or how intellectual you are. You'll never come to God by your intellect. You can't figure him out. You have to come by, listen, you only come to the Lord Jesus Christ through the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. He'll show you your need for him. Not because you figured it out on your own intellect. It is because God stepped in and showed you your need. It's why many will miss heaven by 14 inches. They'll, they'll understand history of the Lord Jesus Christ up here. But they'll never understand him down here in the heart. See, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and just a couple of verses before verse 26 and verse 21. It says, For since, listen, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know Him. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. We get our word moron or moronic from that word foolishness. Nonsense. That's what the gospel is to many that are intellect. It's nonsense. I mean, many just can't believe the message. It seems like nonsense that God, listen, the God of heavens would leave heaven, step out of the glory of heaven, step into the womb of a virgin to be born in a little obscure village, and that he'd live a sinless life. And then he'd go to a cross that he shouldn't have went to to bear the shame and the, and, and the penalty of sin, even though he never sinned, that he would go on a cross and die for other folks just to be buried in a tomb. And not just any old tomb, a borrowed tomb. Why? Because he's only going to need it for three days. Because on the third day he was going to raise again and he was going to be alive and well and he was going to show himself for 40 days and then he's going to catch a cloud back to heaven. And it seems like nonsense to people that have intellect. But can I tell you, God chose the foolish things. And can I tell you, he's coming back. He's coming back. And those folks that think they're smarter than him are going to find out that they never were. Sometimes I think we, sometimes I think, we think we're smarter than we really are. We're too sophisticated. And can I tell you, in our sophistication, we've shut out the Holy Spirit because we're too dignified to get excited about what God's doing. You can take your dignified sophistication to the cross, and it will humble you. I mean, look, we'll hoop and holler and yell at every other event, but get us in church and we're quieter than a church mouse. Could it be that we've met for the event, but we haven't experienced the goodness and the testimony of the Lord Jesus? Because if we did experience it, you'd have, we, we wouldn't be able to hear me preaching because y'all would be shouting. <laughs> and then in verse 8, man, I, I, I'm going to I'm gonna have to close with this. I'm only going to get through one point, Chris. No, two points. We'll pick it up. I might be able to get it. It says, how is it that we hear in each own language which we were born? Rattles off several different regions of the world. See, many believe the reason for this gift of tongues and, and languages was to let people know the gospel. Uh, the, by, the let them know that the gospel was for the world, the whole world, not just a part of the world. Can I tell you, it's for the whole world. That is the theme and the emphasis of the whole book of Acts. Unto the uttermost parts of the world. 
One commentator put it like this. The nearer we get to the spirit of Christ, the more intensely missionary we must become. See, they, they were praising the Lord. Keep in mind, the gospel hadn't been shared yet. They're just praising God for his wonderful work. We're going to see the gospel being presented by Peter in just a little bit. Maybe next week. Maybe. They're talking about the wondrous works of God. Stuff like Exodus 15, 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders? Uh, they're talking about Psalm 40 and verse 5. Many, O Lord, my God, you are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. They're praising the Lord here. and so They're talking probably about things like Psalm 77, 11. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I remember, I will remember your wonders of old. See, the good news here, and especially the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, this is what they were pointing to. This is they're getting the crowd ready to hear the gospel. They're praising God about the wonderful works he did. And now they're hearing it and being reminded in their own language. And then next, Peter's going to stand up and say, let me tell you about the most wonderful work of God of all. And so we see the experience. We are going to get to it. The effect. I'm going to rush to it right quick. So they were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they're full of new wine. The first thing they said is, what does this mean? They begin to inquire, what's behind this? What is the purpose of it? What does, what's happening here in this experience? That represents a group of open minds that are always ready to investigate further before coming to a conclusion. Listen, when the wonderful works of God are spoken, there are always those who want to inquire more. There's always those that want to know more because God's working on their hearts and they'll want to know more. Don't ever underestimate what the Lord can do when we share the wonderful works of God in our lives. Don't ever underestimate. There'll be those that'll want to hear more. That's why it's important that we share the gospel. Look, there's many that are praying for a red wave. And look, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm praying for one. But I'll tell you this, a red wave won't save this country any more than a blue one. It'll take more than a new green deal or a more progressive agenda to save America. Folks worried about climate change and the perceived dangers of, uh, of a made-up uh, hole in the ozone. And a real, listen, the real danger is a denial of the one who made it all, the universe and everything. That's the real danger. So a red wave or a blue wave won't save it. The only thing that will save it is red blood shed at Calvary. Amen. Where love ran red. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> where love ran red. Covered it all. And aren't you thankful that his blood covers it all? But there will be those in the crowd. Always, always, that question. There'll always be those in the crowd, those mocking and questioning the wonderful works of God. See, they were trying to explain away the miracle of this speaking in the languages. And I'll leave you with this and we're going to close. There's good news then and there's a great reminder now. No amount of opposition can stop the work of God that he began at Pentecost. Amen. No amount of opposition. Doesn't matter who opposes it. He's God. He's going to work in his way, in his time, and through his people. Amen. Well, on behalf of our pastor, Terry Smith, and the entire congregation of Living Water Baptist Church, I want to thank you for listening to this online message. We pray you have been encouraged and challenged. We at Living Water believe that every time God's word is communicated, it requires a response. The Bible tells us in James 1.22 that we are to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. So what response do you need to make to be faithful to what you've heard? You can let us know by emailing us at decision at lwbctriad.org. 
Maybe you need to repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Or possibly you've already been saved, but still need to be baptized. Or you want to join our faith family here at Living Water through church membership. Or you simply need us to pray for you. Whatever the need, be sure to email us at decision at lwbctriad.org. We can't wait to minister to you. And before you go, don't forget that you can keep up with everything happening at Living Water by visiting us online at www.lwbctriad.org. And you can also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash lwbctriad. Well, God bless you. Thanks again for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you in person this Sunday.